There are no uninteresting things, only uninterested people. The droll words of English writer and poet G.K. Chesterton, who clearly had never been forced shopping for Tupperware as a child with a mother and three sisters. But what if you want to be interested in something but physically can't? And I do mean physically. See, if you've experienced ADHD, you'll know what I mean. Because for you, boredom mm. isn't just an annoying inconvenience. It's a neurophysiological reality that can derail everything from your employment prospects to your mental or physical well-being. This is due to what researchers call a dopamine deficit, a trait common to the ADHD brain. And the reason why boredom for you can become the overwhelming urge to open email, gobble skittles or blister your thumbs breaking records on Candy Crush. All in an effort to scratch that neurological itch and quell the drive for stimulation, which as it stands, is a challenge society as a whole is becoming increasingly susceptible to. See, studies show attention spans have dropped by as much as 25% in recent years. Endless scrolling, binge watching, binge eating, and a whole Boeing 747's worth of procrastinating. All well-worn habits built by your brain's drive to escape the dreaded boredom itch whilst all the while you tell yourself, this is your fault. You're not disciplined enough. Not conscientious enough, caring enough, not enough. But this is a lie. See, what if I told you that in years gone by, those with ADHD were likely the pioneers of the species, the scouts of the tribe, those with the energy and drive to push beyond the norms of convention. Thomas Edison, Leonardo da Vinci, Nikola Tesla, See, there are many experts today who suggest each of these were touched with ADHD, but discovered ways to harness it, to channel their energies into breaking boundaries and driving for ideas that have literally changed the world. Of course, the inevitable question is, how? Two words, flow states. See, flow is a focused state of mind where time dilates, the complex becomes easy, and you find yourself totally in the moment, working and feeling at your best and in control of the task at hand. And yeah, I'm, I'm talking about a brain state forming with enough dopamine to save the ADHD mind and offer it an outlet so that you can finally achieve what you've always known you are capable of. See, to date, there are 27 proven flow state triggers, habits and practices that can help you find flow pretty much whenever you need it, but only if you know how to use them properly. And the best part is you don't have to be a professional artist or sports person to make use of them. Everyone from Tibetan goat shepherds to accountants can find flow. That's proven too. Although flow isn't an answer to ADHD, it can help to mitigate some of the challenges of it. So here are three quick and handy tips to find your flow on cue and stay on track with your tasks when you need to. First, clear goals. Now, this is a thing that sounds simple, but that people get wrong all the time, horribly. So look, here's what a clear goal isn't. A clear goal isn't, I want to become an astronaut. I want to buy a Maserati. I'm going to attend the Olympics. No, by clear goals, I'm talking clearly defined, immediately actionable intentions and tasks with outcomes that can be measured. And in an ideal world, that are short term. Why? Because your brain doesn't do long term, or at least it doesn't really want to. That stuff is to do with the prefrontal cortex, delayed gratification, future orientation, etc. High cognitive load type stuff. Flow is all about autonomic cognition, being as fully in the moment as possible so that you can do what you're doing without really thinking. Which means that you don't just need to set intentions you can do today, you need to set intentions for right now, this moment. The more clarity you have about what you're doing and how you're doing, the better. You see, it creates a motivational feedback loop that is like light to a moth for flow states. The best way to set the table for this kind of thing is by using implementation intentions. Goals that are specific, measurable, actionable, relevant and time-bound. Yeah, smart. So 
I'm going to do this thing on that day at this time in that place. You see, having this kind of clarity around performing within but at the edge of your skill set is where the magic happens. Second, momentum triggers. Now, this is about reducing the friction of doing the thing. Starting up Mount Everest when you're staring up at its peak from the foot of the mountain just ain't as appealing as being asked to hop over a one foot rock beside your toes. You see, when you break what you've got to do down into its smallest possible action, your brain is like, win. Now, a key part of doing this is having an input focus rather than an output focus. Telling yourself to write a novel or even to churn out 1,000 words a day is a great way to sabotage flow. Commit 10 minutes to working on a chapter, on the other hand, with zero care for how many words you'll churn out in that time, and you'll be surprised by how easy it is to end up in a flow state and want to keep going beyond the limit you'd even set for yourself. In other words, you don't get to those 1,000 words by aiming at them. You get to 2,000 instead by aiming at something far smaller and more controllable. Small commitments of time. Third, body doubling. Yeah, weird term and nothing to do with mannequins or stuntmen or even Madame Tussauds. Body doubling is a practice that's emerged among ADHD coaches as a, as a hack to make focus and concentration easier. Basically, you work with someone else physically present and sure, sounds creepy, but hear me out. You see, you've got to think about it like this. You're not a machine. You can't always tell yourself what to do. You eat cake when you don't mean to. You take the last cookie from the cookie jar. Maybe every now and then, 12 hours of Netflix slumps on a couch with popping up crumbs piling up on your stomach isn't out of the question. What, I'm speaking hypothetically. I don't do that. Point is, you are human. And human beings are inescapably social beings, which means we've got tens of millennia's worth of wiring based on doing things together. Hunting, collaborating, settling in tribes, whatever. You can't switch off and be like, I work better alone because you think it sounds cool. Libraries, offices, co-working spaces. The reason these places work is because they tap into all of that socially wired good stuff down in your limbic system to get you going. The sense of ambient background connection to others focused on their work triggers mirror neurons in your brain, which makes it easier for you to hunker down and get focused too. And voila, there you have it. A key precursor for flow states. Of course, the point of all this is that the muse, inspiration, the genius of the gods, as they used to call it, that heightened but often fleeting state in which we find ourselves excelling in what we're doing and exceeding ourselves, it isn't as capricious and unpredictable as you might think. There are things that you can do to trigger it, harness it, use it. But to do so, you're gonna to have to play by its rules. When you do, you'll find it a lot easier to combat boredom, unleash your creativity, get a ton done and have fun doing it. After all, a little fun never hurt anybody. So, live a little, find your flow. <laughs>